Back in 2003, I designed a mechanics light for a university project. 20 years later, I'm finally bringing it to life. This video is an example of how 3D printing democratizes manufacturing. And by that, I mean the choice on whether an ID comes to life or not isn't just for the wealthy, but is available for everyone. Whereas traditionally, a huge financial investment is required for making injection molding, tooling and setup. Now anyone with a 3D printer, resin in this case, can produce high quality products. Let's start my story by rewinding back to 2003. Straight out of school, I went to uni to study industrial design. Recently, while cleaning, I found a series of old CDRs containing my project work. One of the discs caught my eye, a torch that I designed in my third year, 2003. On the disc, I had a bunch of SolidWorks files from the original CAD design. There was also a series of renderings and then some Photoshop files that seemed to form a booklet explaining the design. This is the LumaMate. If we zoom in, we can see that this is a torch intended for mechanics. I didn't communicate the true purpose well because I didn't want to 3D model an entire engine bay. But the idea is, when working on a dark and cramped engine bay, it can be extremely difficult to get light down into those dark crevices without blocking your view or your hands. Therefore, the LumaMate was a cordless torch with magnets in each of the tripod feet. You could use the magnets to stick the base on the underside of your bonnet and then, using the flexible neck, guide the light source down where you needed it. I have no idea if anything like this has come into the market since, but I was quite proud of my invention back in the day. By importing the SolidWorks files into Onshape, we can see that this was designed to be injection molded. Looking back now, however, it seems this design is a little bit light on detail. For instance, this piece of plastic that holds the battery clip looks quite weak, and this cavity for the spherical magnet is way too big. There's also a distinct lack of detail on how the gooseneck would attach to the bulb subassembly. So I still like the concept, but this would need a redesign to be manufactured properly. The main reason the detail wasn't in place was because I never sourced the actual electronics or hardware. So let's start this time with that. This rendering shows most of the components that I need to find. And we'll start with the battery clips. Here is a spare AA battery case. And it's just right for harvesting pre-made high quality battery springs and clips. To extract them, all we need to do is pull on them with pliers. These can now be cut into smaller segments or soldered into larger ones as required. The original batteries were meant to be dual C size, but this time I'm going for rechargeable lithium ion 18650s, which are pretty easy to get. And if you don't want to harvest them, you can easily buy them secondhand online. So how about those magnets? I did research and purchase some spherical magnets, but the biggest ones I could find were way smaller than an 18650 cell. I was also concerned they wouldn't be strong enough as they wouldn't stick to each other through my hand. So instead I went for the biggest cylindrical magnets I could buy from a regular store. These weren't cheap at $40 a pair, meaning I needed to pay $80 Australian to get three, but the diameter is good and they comfortably pass the hand test. They should be perfect for this application. For a switch, I'm just going to use one of these small ones I have lying around. Since I'm using rechargeable lithium ion batteries, I'm using this Spark Fun single cell charger that I had lying around. The cells are in parallel, acting like one big cell, so this should work. The original used a small incandescent bulb, but I'm going to use compact and efficient 5mm LEDs. Six in parallel with a 160 ohm resistor to suit the 3.7 nominal voltage. To hold this together, I'm going to use random screws I have in my spares tray. So that just leaves the flexible gooseneck. It's very easy to buy a product with a gooseneck to extract. Just search for a flexible light and you'll be amazed how cheap they are. Because I already had it, I went for this gooseneck, which I had pulled out of a lamp some years ago. It was a little bit shorter than I wanted, but it did have a large thread which I could measure and model around on one side. And the other side already had a nut which I could trap inside a printed part. Very importantly, this was of course hollow, with enough room for the wiring to go down the inside. Everything was set for me to start the redesign. This is as far as I got on my first attempt. I started by drawing a cross section of the magnet, a cross section of the cell, and then some basic casing. The cell and the magnet get revolved, followed by the casing. 
I then sketched a basic profile for the upper part of the case and revolved it 120 degrees. We make some cuts and join these two together, use a 2D sketch to split them into top and bottom sections, and then pattern them around 120 degrees apart to form the completed body. The only problem with this was that it was far bigger than I expected and had no chance of fitting on my resin printer. I made a variation where the batteries came closer to the center, but it was still far too large, and then changed to this different configuration that had the cells in the main body of the torch and only the magnets in the tripod legs. After this, it was basically a lot of detail work, creating slots for the battery terminals to clip into, some chunky guides to hold the cells in place, bosses for screwing the two halves together, and of course, all of this needed to be matching on the lower half. This gave me the basic shape, but I still needed to integrate the switch as well as the charger. SparkFun had an STL of the charger which I imported, which I then used to extrude the key components and derived it into its intended position. I then built up a housing that would surround it, added a cutout for the switch to pop into, and merged everything together. One other detail you can see here is called a shadow line. Typically when we design for 3D printing, we have the two halves of something butt up against each other. But in real life injection molded products, there's actually a little trench between the two parts that creates a shadow. For the LED side, I started with a simple extrusion and cut a thread into the internal bore based on what I measured with calipers and a thread gauge. I built up a housing with enough room to have some wiring behind it and then created a matching faceplate with cutouts for the LEDs to push through. After some refinement, I still needed a way to attach these two to each other without screws interfering with the wiring inside. So I came up with this simple locking system where on one end, the two latched into each other and then a self-tapping screw could hold the other end together. Add some fillets and chamfers for refinement and I was ready to print. In terms of slicing, the main thing I concentrated on was making sure all of the support material would be on the inside where you wouldn't see it. Apart from that, I used auto supports generated to attach to the platform. And as usual, the slicer did a tremendous job supporting the model properly, but peeling off by hand. That means I was ready for some test fitment. And first up, the gooseneck. The nut was a bit of a tight fit, but ultimately fell down into its correct position and I was able to attach it to the top housing. Next up, testing one of the rechargeable cells. Everything was good there. The magnets were a snug but accurate fit, but something that didn't work were the terminal clips. I originally set a clearance of 0.1 millimeters to match the thickness of these metal plates, but resin got into the little gap and there was just no chance of the clips going in. The diameter of the bores for the self-tapping screws were also a little bit tight, so they'll need to be enlarged as well. So what about the bottom housing? The clearance for the screws was great, they went through the holes and sat nice and flush, and the bore for the screw that will retain the charger was spot on as well. The cutout for the switch was perhaps a little bit tight, I think it would have gone if I forced it, but I also thought there was a chance I would snap the printed part. The main problem, however, was that the channel I had to put the charger in was very slightly too narrow. Again, I could have forced it in, but I might as well make a change in the design and reprint. If we hold together the two halves, we can see that the shadow line is working as intended. And if you're wondering why the top cover is broken, well, I took the chance, knowing I needed to make changes, to do some destructive strength testing. No problem with being dropped, and it needed quite a hard whack with the mallet to shatter it into pieces. The cutouts in the LED shroud were a little bit tight, and the LED was hard to push the whole way in. The two halves did fit together very nicely, locking in at the top and then sliding in with a snug fit, snug to the point where you might not even need the screw to retain the two together. Unfortunately, the bore for the retaining screw was a little bit too narrow, which cracked the housing, and the base diameter for the thread underneath was also too small, making it impossible to screw the housing onto the gooseneck. Again, I could have forced it, but the housing was starting to crack from being too tight. The beauty of 3D printing means it's easy to iterate and make changes, so I expanded these balls for the LEDs, expanded the ball for the thread, and added a little bit more meat around it. I widened the trench in the lower housing to allow the charger to fit in nicely, and I also offset this battery holder to make it easier to lever the charger into position. And after a few more tweaks based on my prototype, I was ready to reprint. And here are all the version 2 components. We can see that the expanded gap was just right for these battery clips. They slot in quite securely, but not so tight that it feels like the resin parts might snap. 
This gave me a chance to insert one of the cells properly, and once again no problems, it seemed to fit perfectly, as did the screws into the upper housing with the new diameter. The wider trench in the lower housing was just wide enough to slide the charger in easily, and the switch looked to have the proper amount of clearance too. After retaining the charger with its self-tapping screw, I was able to plug in the charging cable, and that was a perfect fit also. So that just leaves the LED housing, and I'm pleased to report that the thread was spot on on the second attempt, as was the bore diameter for the screw that holds the two halves together. Finally, the LEDs could now slide in the whole way, yet they were still snug so they wouldn't wobble. All of the components now fit, so let's assemble it and evaluate. Job one was to lightly sand off any marks left behind from where the support material was removed. I've got little patience for sanding, so I did the bare minimum here. On areas that wouldn't be seen, I used various scrapers to remove any high points from the support to ensure components like the magnets would sit exactly where I wanted them to. Once I had verified that all of the components would fit inside, I put together the two halves to see how they fit. And that gave me good motivation, as I could see how the lamp was going to be when it was completely assembled. I probably should have done this before designing all of the parts, but I made a breadboard circuit to represent the LED array and used a single cell to verify that it was working. I then began the job of transferring the LEDs into their final positions. The way I wired them together was quite simple. I simply folded the legs down so they overlapped and then soldered each junction. Then the second side of LEDs went in and I repeated the process. I trimmed the legs I didn't need and folded the others over to make terminals and a bridge between the left and right columns. I then cut one terminal short, soldered on the resistor and then insulated everything with some heat shrink. Another quick test to make sure there was no shorts or errors. And then I made the connections final while soldering on two wires that I had run through the gooseneck and LED shroud. And of course, everything was insulated once more with heat shrink. There was just enough room for a skinny screwdriver to bolt the two halves together. Then I pulled the excess wiring through, screwed on the LED head, and that completed the LED side. Time to finish off the rest of the wiring in the main housing. I recycled the clipped off leads from the LEDs to solder them between each of the battery terminals, putting the three cells in parallel. I thought it best to include some plugs to attach the switch and the charger on the lower housing to the wires that feed into the upper housing. On either side of the cells was an empty cavity where the plugs could sit. I then crimped on the connectors, and I've got a video linked if you want to learn how to do that, and soldered on the remaining wires to the battery terminals. When crimping these plugs, I made them mismatch so it was impossible to connect the wrong ones. I plugged them both in for one last test. And, as you would hope, when I flicked the switch underneath, the light would turn on and off. With everything working, the magnets can now be inserted, and you need to do this very carefully as they're attracted to the cells and love to fly out and collide. Insert the six screws in the bottom and our assembly is complete. Finally time to test it and see how effective it is. Firstly, as an overqualified desk lamp. Here's the bench when all of the lights in the room are off, and this is what it looks like once the Lumamate is turned on. Next, on the underside of a bonnet, and the magnets are plenty strong to support the weight of the whole lamp. If you're thinking this design could have had a flat base, well, this is why it doesn't. Engine bays don't have that many flat surfaces, and the tripod is more adaptable. So that means we can stick the lamp magnetically to some very unusual shapes, such as heat shields. The light can then be twisted down into cavities to illuminate them as necessary. Note that the car is parked outside, but here's a before for this crevice versus an after, with this uni joint lit up well. Here's one more with the lamp upside down on the bonnet, a before shot with the lamp turned off, followed by an after with it turned on, and I think the difference would be more obvious if I was parked inside the garage. Of course, as soon as I finished it, there was a bunch of improvements that I wanted to make. For instance, having a longer gooseneck, moving all of the components to the upper half, and changing from a charger to a proper BMS to cut power if cell voltage was too low. On the odd chance that you wanted to make your own version of this, everything has been uploaded to printables, including the SourceCAD and some schematics. Hopefully, I've inspired you to pursue your own inventions and at least make one, even if it's just for yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy bringing your ideas to life with 3D printing.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.